At a time of rising cost of living crisis, the Kenyan government has introduced a contentious finance bill which is receiving major opposition from several sections of the Kenyan society. What makes the bill controversial and why is it being opposed? Thousands of members of South Korea's labor unions are on the streets against a union bashing government and its repressive crackdown of union activities. A governor, a football player and a scandal of $77 million. We discuss the story behind Mississippi's largest corruption scandal. This is Daily Debrief. I am your host Shriya and these are the stories for the day. The government of President William Ruto in Kenya has introduced the Financial Bill 2023 at a time when Kenya is facing a growing debt burden and a major cost of living crisis. As the economy battles with rising inflation in recent months, Ruto had already announced his decision to scrap subsidies on fuel and maize shortly after coming to office in 2022 at the directive of the International Monetary Fund. Trade unions and left forces in Kenya are saying that the new tax and levy regimes introduced by the bill will further burden the masses. Tanupriya joins us now to talk about the impact of the new bill on an already struggling economy. Hi Tanupriya, thank you for being with us on the show. First off, can you start off by giving us a background of the economic conditions in Kenya in which this bill has been introduced? Yes, so the government has proposed this finance bill and it is intending to debate or put it up for debate ahead of the national budget. So I believe by next month, this will be put up uh, in parliament. And it has been introduced at a time as, as you said, the country has been going through a major economic crisis. Inflation rates have been very high, driven by uh, food prices and at a time, you know, when Kenya is facing the worst drought in 40 years. So uh, electricity prices have also gone up. Meanwhile, the value of the currency has fallen. So economic conditions have been very difficult. And this was very visible in the protests that took place in the country in the preceding months, which were called by the opposition, but re in, re uh, in reality really spoke to the uh, public anger against the kind of economic conditions that have taken, uh, taken place uh, that are present in the country. And now you have this finance bill, which uh, and uh, some of the major provisions that are causing most concern includes this uh, moved by the government to double the value added tax on uh, things like kerosene, which are very basic goods and they're primarily used by poor households to light their homes for cooking. Uh, and this is going to be a significant jump uh, in, in the price of these products. Um, then there is also, um, we also have, uh, this is taking place at a time when the government has already scrapped subsidies on fuel and food. And this was something that President William Bruto did just days into his presidency. So you now have this additional burden in the absence of subsidies. Uh, over the weekend, uh, fuel prices hit historic levels in Kenya. Uh, the price of kerosene has gone up by over 9%, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, LPG, which is liquid petroleum gas, which the government is trying to make uh, tax exempt, its price has gone up by 30%, over 30% in the past year. So the very basic things that people need, just the very basic material um, things that people need to survive, their prices are going up very significantly. Um, there are also other taxes which are causing a lot of outrage, which will primarily affect um, the majority of poor households in the country. And, you know, again, this is being undertaken by a government that presented itself as very pro-poor. Uh, it promised it was going to tackle the high cost of living. It was not going to raise taxes. But they, in fact, the complete opposite um, has happened. And uh, there's not just in terms of taxation. It is also in terms of a very strong push towards privatization. Uh, we're already seeing it quite significantly in the healthcare sector in Kenya, in education. Um, so... And you have this kind of squeeze being put on the majority of the country uh, through taxation. But at the same time, the government is also really rolling back on its role in key basic services. Um, so we're really seeing uh, the further burdening of working class and poor communities in the country. Right, Priya. Uh, and public sector unions, they have been opposing this bill for quite some time. Uh, protests have taken place earlier also. Uh, so what are some of the issues that these unions have highlighted? Right. Uh, so one of the reasons that the government is doing this, the finance bill, the whole move to introduce taxes is because of a potential cash crunch. So Kenya is facing a very high debt burden and uh, billions of dollars due in interest payments this year alone. So uh, and at the same time, because these are dollar denominated payments, the country is also facing a decline in its foreign reserves. So amid this cash crunch, in March, the government delayed paying salaries to civil servants. And at that time as well, public sector unions were obviously very vocal in their opposition to this because this was also the time when, you know, you have, you're having protests almost every week. The economic conditions are quite difficult. And uh, there were also sections of workers, especially at the county level, who had not been paid since January. So there is also this squeeze on the wage. But... Uh, 
coming specifically to the finance bill what has caused a uh, concern for workers is this idea of a 3% mandatory deduction to go towards the housing fund so the government is trying to sort of uh, take 3% out of or workers will essentially have to contribute 3% of their earnings to go towards this housing fund um for to access affordable housing but even in that will be subject to a different kind of criteria not every worker might qualify so even then um you know you have this kind of a deduction taking uh, taking place what has also caused um, anger is the fact that according to unions estimations there are already other existing statutory deductions um, on workers take home wages so now they say that with this additional burden uh, 52% of the wage is going to just go towards these deductions and whatever is left that in itself is going to be subject to vat because you know when you're talking about public finance as a public sector worker you're not just earning a wage you're also a consumer you're participating in the economy so So, um even whatever leftover wage they have that is also going to be subject to taxation and what the issue has also been is the fact that kenya's constitution mandates that the government must engage with workers representatives when it's trying to introduce um, such changes that has not happened and unions have been very vocal about that and uh, these deductions are also taking place which i mentioned earlier through this uh, alongside this push for privatization so for instance one of the deductions is for the national health insurance fund and public health activists in kenya have been very vocal that you know the world bank particularly is pushing to include the private sector uh, towards the nhi so uh, it's going to make healthcare more privatized it's going to sort of the the private sector is being reimbursed at much higher rates so um, the workers wages are being squeezed they're also being denied an effective public healthcare system and um, all of this the, these revenues that the government is trying to raise is in pursuit of um, loans uh, the government is already facing a debt burden but it is planning or gearing up for further loans from the imf from world bank from other sources and to do that it's trying to demonstrate its ability to raise revenue how that revenue is being raised is the question and we see that here it's being raised off of the backs of workers and poor households in the country um if the government does go ahead with the imf uh, and another, another arrangement we can unfortunately see public services like healthcare and education be hit again because that has been consistent um throughout imf engagements around the world um but even if we just talk about revenue uh, what something the communist party of kenya for instance has talked about is the fact that even if you're trying to raise revenue the way that you're doing it uh, you're not doing it through imposing an inheritance tax you're not doing it by um, imposing a, a adequate corporate taxes there is not really a redistributive agenda in place instead you're just really pushing down um on communities who are already struggling to survive right thank you so much for that update tanupriya nearly 40000 labor union members including members of the korean confederation of trade unions marched to the president's office this week in protest of an ongoing government crackdown that led to a trade unionist committing suicide by setting himself on fire on may 1st tensions between unions and the conservative yoon sukyol a uh, government have been building recently over alleged harassment of the unions by the authorities we go to anish now who has the latest details on the story hi anish thanks for joining us uh, what's happening in south korea what are some of the issues that the trade unions are trying to highlight well uh, one thing we need to know is that it's been nearly a year since yul sok yul has been in the presidency and uh, his administration has been marked among various other things has been marked by uh, you know very strong repression of uh, trade union movements working class movements especially in general and uh, that has uh, created a great deal of friction we saw that during the uh, the truck workers strike uh, sorry the truck driver strike and the construction workers strike uh, that happened last year and in many cases uh, the yoon government just uh either did not uh, heed to any of the demands that the trade unions have been pushing forward for when it comes to contract negotiations or for that matter for getting a fair contract and fair wages and other stuff or for that matter they just completely uh went against them uh even uh, in initiating investigations against uh major trade union headquarters and their officials now this is definitely part of a larger attack on the working class movement now among other things like while south korea is definitely among the uh, the more uh, or has a more organized working class when it comes to trade union membership when compared to several other developed uh, countries in the same category uh, there are issues definitely that the workers are grappling with in uh, several cases you're looking at high rate of unemployment high rate of contract workers 
and contractualization and casualization of workers. And uh, we also see uh, prolonged working hours in many cases that is caused by lack of regulation. In some cases, that's just, uh, you know, changes in labor laws that the government is trying to push in different sectors. So in all of these, uh, the workers are trying to highlight at the center of it, they're trying to highlight how uh, there is a con concerted attack against trade unions because it's not just one trade union we're talking about. It's like a, in different sectors, you have different kind of investigations happening. And on the other hand, there is definitely uh, an attack on workers' rights as well. And this is something that the protests have highlighted currently. Uh, rightly said, uh, Anish, uh, tensions have been rising between the unions and the government in South Korea. Uh, are we expecting to see more such collective actions in future? Yeah, for sure. Uh, because uh, for one, uh, apart from the strike, uh, sorry, the protest that has happened on the 16th and the 17th, uh, workers, uh, union, trade union movements, as, uh, especially the KMWU, uh, had uh, already announced a four-hour warning strike on May 31st. And we can expect more coming from them and other trade unions as well. Uh, the K KMWU is one of the one of those trade unions that have been uh, at, under attack uh, through different, you know, various kind of ju judicial legal uh, instruments that the government is trying to employ against them, are uh, alleging them of, uh, you know, getting foreign funding or some kind of foreign conspiracy. Uh, trying to uh, sort of use the sort of Cold War arguments of them being, you know, secretly socialist. You've seen, you see that in the kind of debates and discourses that uh, people uh, who either support the ruling party or are from the ruling party make in different statements. And so this sort of thing is going to continue. Uh, if uh, and for that, definitely the workers are going to fight back. We're looking at, uh, uh, you know, this is just one trade union confederation that has over a million uh, members, full-time members uh, across the country. There are others as well. And obviously, they're not going to sit tight and, you know, or, you know, just uh, not have any kind of involvement in such kind of repression happening. Uh, the fact that uh, they're also highlighting the suicide of uh, a trade unionist and a construction worker uh, who uh, who self immolated himself uh, on the first May first or you know what in the International Workers Day that we commemorate usually? Uh, it also highlights the kind of desperation that workers are usually pushed to because if uh, people like you know somebody like a construction worker is already uh, facing uh, rising prices, uh, higher cost of living, and definitely stagnating wages over you know more than a decade in many cases. And on the other hand, they have to also face uh, lawsuits that is initiated by the government, uh, which have which are very difficult to fight. You know, federal lawsuits are very difficult for anybody in any part of the world. Uh, and even in South Korea, it's not going to be any different. So the fact that somebody like him was uh, pushed to that de desperation that he had to self-emulate uh, to highlight the issues that are affecting the working classes, and the fact that work, uh, working class movements are highlighting it shows that this is a general problem. And this can also create a bigger issue uh, and a wider class conflict in the coming days. Right. Thank you so much for joining us, Anish, and for that update. Brett Favre, a former football player with the record of playing in 20 seasons of the National Football League, is in news for his alleged role in what has been called the biggest corruption scandal involving public money in the state of Mississippi, United States. Although the former quarterback has not been charged criminally, a new report by Michael Rosenberg of Sports Illustrated reveals his role in the misappropriation of state funds meant for the poorest of the poor. Siddhant Annie joins us now for the latest details on the story. Hi Siddhant, thanks for joining us. So, uh, what is really the involvement of Brett Favre in this case, uh, which is also being called the largest corruption scandal in the state of Mississippi? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Shreya. Public prosecutors have called it uh, the biggest sort of public embezzlement of, of uh, or embezzlement of public money in the history of that state. Uh, reporters who have been covering the story have uh, said that the total amount of misappropriation, it's, it's of course, on an uh, American scale, right? They, when they do things, they do, they do them big. Uh, it's around 77 million US dollars. So a uh, huge, huge amount of money. Uh, 
The reason we're talking about it today is uh, is a couple of things. There have been, of course, further indictments in this case. Also, uh, of a couple of uh, so uh, certainly a couple of athletes are or former athletes are definitely involved. I think international audiences who watch professional wrestling, WWF as it used to be called, WWE uh, now, I think. Uh, there used to be someone called Ted DiBiase, the million dollar man uh, back in the day. He's a wrestler from the 80s and his two sons. They are also implicated in this uh, a ministry or a church uh, that Ted DiBiase Sr. Uh, runs. Apparently received more than two million US dollars. Uh, his sons have received hundreds of thousands of US dollars. Uh, some people are, of course, pleading guilty to these charges uh, based on revelations as they are coming out. Several bureaucrats are implicated. And, and actually, the implications of this scam go all the way up to uh, the former governor of the state, Phil Bryant. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's, of course, not hard to uh, understand or imagine how these, uh, these guys have gone about orchestrating all of this. Uh, because Phil Bryant, for example, is the kind of person who believes that churches should be doing much of the work that governments currently do. Uh, and, you know, especially in the realm of uh, welfare, uh, providing assistance to those who need it the most, helping the poorest of the poor. And that's what uh, really actually the crux of this story is that money that was meant, for, uh, the, the, there's a fund called the Temporary Assistance uh, it, uh, for a Needy Families Fund. Uh, which is supposed to be disbursed in the form of welfare checks and food assistance to those who really, really need it. Now, money from uh, that fund has been appropriated to build a $5 million volleyball venue for the University of Southern Mississippi, which Brett Favre, the legendary quarterback uh, that we that you, you were talking about, uh, had promised to the university. He, belonged, he, he went to that university. They offered him a scholarship. He played college uh, football there. Uh, but he didn't want to pay for it, it seems. Uh, and uh, uh, Michael Rosenberg, who's a reporter at my uh, former publication, Sports Illustrated, has a very long piece out. Uh, I was reading it early this morning. It's a fascinating story. Uh, it's, a, it's a long investigation that follows up on the work done by the likes of uh, Anna Wolf, uh, who's a reporter with uh, Mississippi Today. Uh, shout out to all these reporters, by the way. It, it's also... The story is also great because it highlights the value of uh, local uh, independent journalism and asking questions uh, to uh, people who are in who are uh, representatives of the public, you know, holding public office, whether it's bureaucrats or politicians. Um, Brett Favre himself is unabashedly right wing. He's a he's a Trump supporter. Uh, he appeared on a podcast the other day where he was talking about how. Uh, the United States were, was in a better place when Trump was in charge. And then he's gone on to make some really unsavory statements uh, about trans people. You know, and all this while, while he's being accused uh, or, well, uh, the, the investigation is on. And, and, and what Michael Rosenberg's uh, very long piece uh, reveals that there's enough, uh, what do we call it, uh, enough smoke in this story to indicate that there is a fire somewhere. Uh, Right, the text messages indicate have, have shown exchanges between uh, Brett Favre and uh, several bureaucrats, as well as the governor, all chasing this cash uh, to pay for this volleyball center that he really, really, it seems, didn't want to pay. He could easily have signed a check. He's a multi, multi, multi millionaire, uh, but he so he could have easily written a check and it would have been done and dusted. But that's not how he wanted to go about it. What he wanted to do was make the government pay for it somehow. Uh, and they have done it in this uh, really convoluted manner. And uh, by uh, what it seems, uh, at least what the state is saying, the public prosecutors are saying, is definitely a misappropriation of, of funds. So, so uh, essentially the story today is that Brett Favre is not in the clear as far as this case is concerned. And if further evidence or, or, or if the prosecutors feel that they have managed to uncover enough, then a pos the possibility of an indictment uh, is also still open. So that's essentially the, why we are talking about it uh, today. Uh, right, Siddhant. And for our audience, could you also explain how does uh, the welfare schemes and the social security system in the United States works? And how, so, I mean, you explained already about the... Yeah, uh, so I, I think... 
I think what what I have learned from reporters who are uh, sort of who work uh, on on this beat uh, is essentially that a lot of the the wording and uh, the the sort of language around uh, a lot of these a lot of these welfare monies is kept deliberately vague so that states have uh, the ability to kind of use that money for various things and and and. Uh, I don't know whether this is done deliberately at the federal level in the United States to to make sure that uh, you know things happen uh, in a more expeditious way, or that money uh, the states can disburse uh, funds easily to those who need it. But what has ended up happening over time in several of these states, and it has to be I think pointed out that several of these states are Republican governed, uh, that over time less money is progressively being spent on what is. I suppose the most important function of this money, which is providing, like like the word say, uh, temporary assistance to needy families, right? So, <clears throat> money from uh, welfare checks has reduced. Uh, money on food uh, stamps, food uh, assistance has reduced. Instead, because it sort of this money can kind of be used legally for all kinds of things. Uh, those in positions of power in public office have been uh, over time using uh, these monies for their own pet projects. For example, in, in the same state of Mississippi, uh, money is being spent on things like uh, encouraging work and marriage, uh, ensuring that there are less children out of wedlock, you know, uh, things like this, which uh, A, are, I suppose, hard, very hard to gauge uh, and B, not, I'm not sure necessarily fall under the purview of what the state needs to be doing. So if, uh, for example, Governor Phil, former Governor Phil Bryant believes that the church should be looking at aspects of uh, taking care of uh, welfare uh, needs of people, uh, then, you know, discuss, these kind of discussions about wedlock and having children out of it also is in the, in, in those, in the purview of those kind of institutions and, and not at all uh, the state. Uh, so a lot of the money that has gone to some of these former wrestlers, for example, has gone for things like motivational speaking uh, with very little to show in terms of what life changing activity uh, the or what life changing motivational speaking Ted DiBiase uh, is doing that requires millions of dollars of state money to be spent uh, on his effort. You know, so 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 these kind of uh, very obvious, it seems, red flags uh, are uh, peppered all over the system. Uh, and uh, there, there's a great deal of reportage on it. So uh, I would, uh, I th I'm sure we're running out of time as well. So so I would just, I would really recommend uh, to our viewers to spend the weekend, you know, checking out, check out Anna Wolf, check out Michael Rosenberg's story. It's a great story uh, on, on SI.com. And... Uh, and I think definitely it seems with this kind of information coming into public, one thing is for sure that conversations around how welfare works in the U.S. will continue uh, and that uh, Brett Favre's involvement in this particular scam is not over yet. Thank you so much for that uh, update and for that to telling us about that story, Sidhan. And that's all we have for today. For more such stories, keep watching peoplesdispatch.org. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook.